Hey guys, um, so tonight we're going to do this little snippet over chest trauma and chest tubes. And so the purpose of these snippets is not to give you all the information that you need to know, but just kind of give some of the big highlights um, and just kind of get you started to think about like what's important or what do I need to focus on in these different topics. So when we're talking about chest trauma, you know, trying to figure out what's the big deal. Well, of course, you know, our chest is where we breathe. Um, so if there's some sort of chest trauma that happens, um, rib fractures, stabbing, seatbelt injuries, whatever it is, it can actually puncture the lung. Um, if it doesn't do that, it can damage the respiratory muscle and you need your muscles to be able to help you to breathe adequately. And then of course, if there's bleeding or other or certain trauma that can happen, it can also lead to shock, which can lead to death. You know, the thing that we're always trying to avoid. Um, you know, which symptoms are we going to see in this patient? It's really going to vary. Um, the chest trauma can vary. Like I mentioned, it could be something like, hey, I was in a car accident. My seat belt caught me across my chest. It can be like in this picture where there's literally a knife in the person's chest. Um, sometimes there can be an object, um, you know, uh, or the signs of visible trauma. Sometimes their chest is going to look normal, but there's something going on inside, um, like rib fractures. So that's a lot of times where we want to start looking at breathing problems. Because another thing that a patient with chest trauma might complain about is um, having difficulty breathing. You may attach them to a cardiac monitor and their oxygen levels will be low. They may be breathing fast. And they can also sometimes have like a flail chest or an asymmetrical pattern of breathing. Um, or maybe one side of their chest is not rising equally to their other side of their chest. Um, especially if there's some sort of um, blunt trauma involved, they can also have cardiovascular problems. So they may have signs of shock, the low blood pressure, high heart rate, um, or signs of bleeding might be present. And you always have to think about if I'm looking for bleeding, I need to look for obvious signs, you know, like there, I can actually see the bleeding. And then remember, I'm also going to look at my blood pressure and it'll be low because I'm losing volume. My heart rate, it'll be high because my heart is beautiful and tries to compensate. Um, or, um, you know, checking a hemoglobin level or looking for signs that um, someone may be bleeding inside where I can see actual accumulation of blood or signs, um, you know, in the patient just in their perfusion that they're not getting oxygenated the way that they need to because they're losing blood. So emergency management for a patient that has um, some sort of trauma, like if it was this person right here with the knife in their chest, I'm going to start with their airway. Is their airway patent? And when I say patent, is this like, can oxygen get in? Is there anything actually collapsing? Because sometimes people can have chest trauma and they can literally have an object going through, um, you know, their breathing tube. And so if that happens, they're not going to be able to have a patent airway or keep their airway open. So I want to see, can they keep their airway open? And um, even if it is open, like, is there a whole bunch of mucus? or other junk that's blocking it? You know, is there anything in the way that's going to prevent them from being able to take, um, you know, uh, uh, get oxygen in, like any sort of obstruction? Um, also swelling in the airway. So, you know, the body always reacts to injury through swelling. So even if they didn't have an injury to their airway, that an injury around their airway, it can cause them to have swelling there. Um, I'm also going to check their level of consciousness. Um, you know, some patients, they may, there, there may be nothing wrong with their airway, but because maybe they were in a car accident, had blunt trauma to their chest, um, you know, maybe like hit the steering wheel or something like that, but they're so sleepy for maybe they're like intoxicated or on drugs. Um, so even if they have an open airway, no damage to their airway, no problem there. If they're not awake enough that if they, um, you know, something started going down into their throat that they can't, they're not awake enough to cough it out, you know, I'm going to be concerned about that. Um, and then of course, I'm going to elevate their head of the bed to try to prevent aspiration or any issues like that. I'm also going to look at their breathing. First and foremost, are they breathing? <laughs> you know, that's always a good start. And then I'm going to monitor and provide oxygen as needed, um, making sure to supplement because, you know, we always think about that supply and demand. And if I've just had a major trauma, then, you know, I may have a higher demand for oxygen or I might have a decreased supply because all of my supply might be somewhere else. Um, I'm also going to want to manage the patient's pain. And this is a, you know, a hard balance. Like most people think like, hey, um, you know, most opioids, they're going to suppress the respiratory drive. So I don't want them because I want this patient breathing. Um, and that's true. We do want the patient breathing, but it's a fine balance. Um, you're going to find when you get out into practice that we cannot, um, you know, just um, ignore people's pain, especially with rib fractures. Like sometimes we're sitting there and, you know, we, we don't want them to be knocked out where they're, they're not taking any breaths, but we need to give them 
them some medications because if we don't give them any medications, a lot of times what happens is that they're in so much pain, they're not going to be willing to take a deep breath. Chest trauma hurts. It literally feels like someone sometimes, um, you know, because sometimes it's actually what happened. Like someone, you know, just sliced down your chest. Um, you cannot bear, like you're going to ache to like, um, you know, uh, take a breath in. And so if we have to give them some pain medicine to get them to breathe enough in order to take some deep breaths so that they don't get pneumonia and other things like that, we're gonna have to find that balance. And, um, you know, the doctor will um, work with you on that and you can kind of help to find that balance um, for your patient to make sure that they have enough pain management where they're taking deep breaths, um, but not so much that they're not breathing at all. <laughs> So yes, then also their circulation. Um, we want to make sure that obviously if this patient had a blunt trauma and they are maybe possibly bleeding, we want to establish IV access, do a good fluid resuscitation, um, which means, you know, giving them fluid to replace what was lost. Now, here's the thing. If I'm bleeding out, it's great to give me fluid because that's going to at least, it's like a Band-Aid. It's going to give me something back. But as much as I need volume, I need blood because what's in blood that's not in regular fluids? Oxygen. I need the oxygen from the hemoglobin, um, you know, to travel to help, to, especially if I'm dealing with a trauma or something else, I'm going to need that um, bit of extra. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, try to give them IV access, fluid resuscitation or blood products if needed. Um, if there's any bleeding wounds, I'm going to apply pressure or pressure dressings to those wounds. And if there's any impaled objects like a knife, I'm not pulling that thing out. I'm going to stabilize it and let the doctor come do their magic. So another, um, you know, kind of consequence or type of chest trauma that can happen is what's called a pneumothorax. And there's a couple different types of thoraxes. You know, we talk about it, you know, a hemothorax and um, all that other stuff. Like, you know, I'm going to just focus on this one because this is one of the most common ones. And when I'm talking about a pneumothorax, what I'm talking about is effectively there is air in the lung space. So you can kind of see in this picture um, where this um, arrow is pointing. Effectively, if you look on um, the, like the, this patient's left lung, you can see all these branches where they're, um, uh, what do you call it, getting oxygen to their alveoli. Down here, like if you look at this like little circular thing here, that's their lung and it's collapsed. And all this black space, usually we like black space, it means oxygen's getting in. All that black space is a bunch of air in a hollow space. It's not in their lung. Um, and so, you know, effectively, um, you know, what happens is, uh, you know, or what I should say, what commonly happens is that um, people are involved in trauma. They're on a ventilator for long periods of time, um, which causes damage to their lungs. They could have lung disease um, or they get like a central line placed or something like that um, and they it actually punctures their lung um, where it deflates and then um, there's all this extra air we have to get out. So what does a patient who has a pneumothorax look like? So a patient who has a collapsed lung or a deflated lung, they look very uncomfortable. They usually have a lot of respiratory symptoms, literally um, you know, they, um, their lung is collapsed. So, and even though it might only be on one side, um, it's still going to be very, very hard to breathe. They're going to have an increased respiratory rate. Their body's trying to compensate. Um, they may have asymmetrical movement. One of the things you're, the first things you might notice is they have absent breath sounds and you should never have absent breath sounds. You can have diminished or quieter breath sounds, but they should never be absent. And usually it's going to be one-sided because most of the time people do not collapse both their lungs at the same time. They do sometimes. I'm not going to lie. It does happen. But, um, you know, most of the time these patients, like, you know, like I said, it's like they put a central line in and so they'll puncture the one side, et cetera. Um, and then if they get to the point where it's like a tension pneumothorax, they can even have tracheal deviation, which means, you know, there's so much pressure from the air that's building up in that space where the lung is supposed to be, that it actually pushes my trachea or my windpipe over to the opposite side. And this can lead to serious life and death consequences. So if I ever noticed that, um, and especially I would notice that in like a chest x-ray, uh, I got to get some help quick because we really need to get that air out before something major happens. So this is kind of, this is a picture to kind of show you. So, you know, where's the heart supposed to be? <laughs> you know, the heart's supposed to be on the other side, but look at how bad this collapsed lung is. So you can kind of see the outline of it here on the left side and all this black space. That's a whole bunch of air and the air is literally pushing the heart to the other side of the body, pushing the trachea to the other side of the body. You can imagine what a problem that would be. How do you think your heart feels, um, you know, when, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's uh, literally, it has so much pressure that it's pushing it to the, the other side of the body. Um, how do you think that other lung is feeling? <laughs> you know, that it, they only, we only have one lung going for them. And on top of that, you know, um, you know it's not going to be able to expand and the heart's not going to be able to contract the way it's supposed to. 
So um, treatment, obviously for this one, there's gonna be some treatment, but sometimes, you know, there's just a little bit of a collapse lung or like, you know, there's um, a little bit of air in that um, space, um, not a huge collapse and it can actually resolve on its own. Um, but most of the time, what we do for these patients is what's called a needle decompression where we, you know, let immediately let some air out um, or insert a chest tube um, to try to allow for that air to escape. Because effectively just kind of think of like, you know, um, like and pretty much there's just all this air trapped in the space. So we're sticking a tube in there to to suck that, uh, get that air sucked out so that the lung actually has room to expand and go back to where it's supposed to be. Um, so, you know, as the nurse, uh, my job in the patients that have pneumothoraxes and chest tubes, I'm going to monitor their chest drainage unit, and I'm going to be monitoring for what's called a leak. And effectively what that is, is that obviously I'm trying to get air out of this patient. So there's gonna be, we're gonna talk about different chambers that are um, within the chest tube. And there's some of them that should have some air coming out because I'm trying to get air out of the patient. But there's also gonna be some places that there shouldn't be too much air or there shouldn't be air, um, what do you call it, um, in those areas. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, but it's my job to kind of monitor, you know, that equipment and things like that to see how they're doing. How are they tolerating this um, chest tube? I'm also gonna monitor the drainage or the output. It shouldn't be more than 100 milliliters per hour. That can be a sign of a massive problem, especially if it changed, like if it was air and all of a sudden they're dumping blood out of that, that's a really big problem. Um, so if I have uh, output greater than 100 milliliters per hour, I'm gonna to need to report that to the doctor. I'm also going to be monitoring their chest. Um, what can happen is, you know, there's all this excess air. Um, and so sometimes it actually literally tries to leave throughout, like um, out of the chest wall cavity through the skin. And they kind of call it the snap, crackle, pop. And it's like you literally feel and you feel kind of like that um, when you get a package and you're popping those bubbles. That's what it feels like on the patient's skin. And it's right around the side, like where usually where the um, their lung is collapsed, but it can actually spread everywhere and it can cause huge issues. I once took care of a patient literally head to toe covered in that sub like you could pop it on her face, on her neck, and she obviously had to have a breathing tube because with that much air everywhere in her body, um, it could literally, um, you know, we talked about things that close off the airway or they, are they able to keep their airway open? And if you have air everywhere in your body, especially pressing on your airway, it's a huge issue. So effectively what I'm gonna do with patients is every time I have a patient with a chest tube or collapsed lung, anything like that, I'm gonna be feeling around their chest and see if any of the air is trying to escape through the skin. And if I feel any of it, I'm gonna mark it. And I'm gonna mark it to kind of see if it's getting better or worse, or uh, make at least making sure that it's not getting worse. It's not an emergency necessarily if they have it, but, um, I need to be monitoring it closely. And it's, uh, what do you call it? It's usually a sign that they have a pretty severe, um, you know, um, pneumothorax if it's trying to escape through the skin. So I have to keep a really close eye on that subcutaneous emphysema because that can be um, a warning sign of a bigger problem. And I need to make sure, especially that it's not getting worse. Um, I'm gonna monitor and change the dressing um, for that the patient has over their chest tube and do a very thorough respiratory um, assessment and support their oxygenation. Um, so I was talking about this chest tube drainage system, and this is something that I found confusing for many years when I first started as a nurse, um, and a lot of students find confusing. Um, but what it is, is effectively, um, this is the chamber where air can escape, we can drain any fluid if any fluid needs to get drained, um, and it pretty much helps for them um, to allow for the lung to re-expand without putting more air back in. Um, and so, um, uh, effectively, you know, there's a couple different chambers here and you can kind of see there's the collection chamber and the collection chamber is where the air or the fluid is, uh, is collected. So if I have any drainage coming out, this is where I'm measuring it. Um, or if any air is coming out, I'm not seeing the air because air is, <laughs> you know, you can't see it. Um, but um, this is how it's escaping. And this is how the air that's in the patient um, um, that's coming out of that lung space um, that I'm trying to, uh, you know, make more room for their lung to re-expand. It comes through this tube and then is, there's like a one-way valve that it can go out of through this um, <clears throat> drainage system. But I'm also going to be measuring, like one of my jobs as a nurse is going to be to measuring if they are having output. Again, remember I said we don't want more than 100 milliliters per hour. Uh, there, the next chamber is the chamber you want to pay the most attention to, and that's what's called the water seal chamber. Um, and the water seal chamber, especially when a patient has a brand new chest tube, we may see occasional um, bubbling or air. And you know, it's literally you're looking at it and you can see little bubbles in it. Um, you know, and you can also see what's called titling, which means as the patient takes breaths in and out, there's like a water and it's kind of in this long, um, you know, um, the one that's between B and C, this long little. Um, 
uh, what do you call it? Um, I, I don't even know what to call it. Kind of like a, a ruler looking like thing. So it's the, the little chamber in between B and C. Um, you know, that, that actually has, um, like you can actually see the water go up and down with their breathing. That's normal. So let me, let me refresh. In the water seal chamber, I can have occasional bubbles. I can have, um, you know, occasionally see kind of a little bit of bubbles here and there. So usually it's kind of like, boop, boop, you know, like very, very little. Um, I can have some titling, you know, where the, you can see it go up and down, like where it's almost like, think of tidal waves, like where you can see the water level go up and down as they're taking breaths. That's normal. Um, but as the, as the patient has the chest tube, it should be getting better. So if, I, if, if I've been taking care of a patient and they had no bubbling at all, and all of a sudden they have bubbling, that's going to be a problem. Um, if they have continuous bubbling there, that should not be present. Um, you know, if any, any sort of increased or continuous bubbling is going to be a sign of a problem in the water seal chamber. Um, on the other hand, there's also a suction control chamber. So there's a suction chamber and there's a couple different of these systems. Some of them have dry suction, wet suction, whatever. You don't need to get too, too in depth with that. Just realize um, if there is gentle bubbling in the suction control chamber, that's normal too, because that's actually what's telling you that the suction is attached. So there should be some gentle bubbling. So to kind of sum up the collection chamber, there should be fluid that you're measuring. Water seal chamber, no bubbling, gentle bubbling, like, or, or I shouldn't even want to say gentle, occasional bubbling. It shouldn't even be like continuous. So water seal chamber, occasional bubbling, and the titling is normal. And then suction control chamber, that's the one that should have gentle bubbling. So, um, you know, uh, the suction control chamber can have continuous bubbling. It should. That's showing that you have suction attached to this patient. And you need that suction to help um, to create that seal that's going to allow for the lung to re-expand. Um, but again, just to reiterate, the water seal chamber, it should have not, never have continuous bubbling or increased bubbling. Um, that's why it's always really important to get a really good report um, with, uh, from your previous nurse because, uh, you know, it, whatever they're doing or whatever's normal for them, you always want to know what their baseline is. If they just got this put in and they've had a lot of bubbling because they just got it put in, it's really good to get that information from the nurse so you know what's their baseline or what's their normal. As a whole with these chest tubes, we want to do no clamping, no milking, and we want to keep it below the heart level. Um, and that's going to just help to prevent any air from going back in. Um, and um, uh, of course, like, you know, if I clamp um, a chest tube, that's how air is escaping. So pretty much then the air is going to put pressure back in. It can end up leading to a tension pneumothorax. So my priorities and goals or my role as the nurse as a whole in chest trauma is I want to have um, this patient to have adequate oxygenation and an effective breathing pattern. Um, I want to make sure that obviously they're showing signs of improvement. So I'm going to do regular assessments, not only just assessments of their equipment to make sure it's in order. And when I do an assessment of a patient with a chest tube or chest trauma, I always start. I don't start at the equipment. I start at the patient and I, I look at their dressing. I make sure that it's intact. Then I start looking before I make sure their sutures are intact and then I, tr I trace it all the way down and I make sure all my connections are secure. I make sure everything's attached. There's no leaking, no holes um, and um, follow that all the way to the chest drainage unit and then assess what's going on in each of my chambers. So always start at the patient and then move to the chest drainage system. Um, and um, you know, of course, I'm also going to be doing regular assessments of their respiratory system. What do their lungs sound like? You know, are those absent sounds getting better? Um, you know, uh, and by the way, since this is attached to suction, sometimes you, when, you know, when you're listening in the chest, you're going to hear some noises. And you're going to be like, what is that noise? And, you know, remember, this is attached and it's literally sucking out that air. So, you know, uh, keep in mind that's, uh, that's common to kind of hear some strange sounds and be like, what's that noise? Um, and so... Um, we're going to be listening to, uh, to lung sounds. We're going to be feeling for that subcutaneous emphysema or that snap, crackle, pop to show that they are maybe having air that's trying to escape through their skin. Make sure that's not getting worse. I'm going to keep their head of bed elevated to support their oxygenation. Um, and I'm going to give them uh, supplemental oxygen as ordered. And of course, try to prevent complications. I want to make sure that they're showing, um, they're not showing any signs of attention pneumothorax, um, that they're able to breathe adequately, their pain is managed, um, and they're able to, um, you know, meet all the goals that, um, that they need to have, depending, of course, depending on the individual patient. So that's just a little kind of beginning to what is chest trauma and how can we best take care of these patients. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Have a good night.